Hi, this is William Harry's Graham, and you're here watching Time to Connect. Hey, William Harry's Graham, man, thank you so much for taking the time to connect. Yeah, of course, thanks for having me. You bet, man. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Really appreciate you you doing this. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm a bit tired. It was a long day, but yeah. productive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you. Uh, I won't keep you too long, but um, uh, you're in Austin, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in Austin. Uh, luckily, we're having a bit of good weather, which has been... <laughs> rather welcomed yeah yeah i know man i know i lived in austin for years um now uh have you lived there your entire life or did you ever say i got to get away for a while i um <laughs> i have lived here my entire life yeah. um it's it's a i've like spent time other places for you know like sure. a couple months but yeah. um never longer than that so it's always been at the very least kind of home base for me, which, I don't, which, you know, I don't think there's anywhere else quite like Austin. So, yeah, man, I moved to Austin in 1973 and, and discovered very, or excuse me, I moved to Texas in 73 and, and discovered very quickly. Austin is, is the place to be. Of course, it's a little different than it was in 1973. Uh, but I kid you not, man, I heard, a, I heard a conversation on the street back then. Someone was talking about, oh man, you should have been here in the '60s, and uh, and and an, an old timer at the time said, "No, man, it was the '50s. That's when Austin was really cool." So I suppose that uh, conversation will go on forever. Well, listen, man, I want to definitely want to talk about your upcoming uh, third album release. Congratulations on that. Um, there are only endings when when we uh, when this episode goes live. It will. I'm pretty sure it will be out at that time. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about your songwriting and gigs um your dad will probably come up in the conversations uh other yeah. things other things happening in your life but let's start with a little personal history um and i, I just i gotta say man you um you you definitely did not have the normal childhood i mean you, no uh, you you're the son of a bona fide rock star you had your first gig at six years old and and usually when you hear someone say something like that they you find out oh it was just at a little private party no you you had a gig at the austin music awards when you were six years old and and, and pretty much started right off at that point holy crap uh i want to ask you what that was like um and then i just discovered this wired called you one of the 50 people who will change the world no pressure william <laughs> none wow none. wow man well, let me shut up for a minute and just say well what were you like as a kid what was it like growing up there for you um yeah i mean so i i definitely had um i mean in some ways a, a typical childhood and you know i i had a really good life growing up um but it it was also unusual in the fact that uh, my dad's John D. Graham, who again has you know speaking of Austin, been in Austin, had a, some like brief stints in other places like L.A., but essentially since the '70s, has been in Austin and has been ingrained in the Austin music culture for so long. And I um I I would say that that the the biggest thing growing up for me was that I I didn't really understand th that music was not always a part of people's lives and wasn't so deeply ingrained. I, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I always kind of give the example when I was growing up that um, the first question I would ask someone when I'd meet them was what instrument they played because it the concept that someone would not uh -huh. play an instrument was just uh -huh. not it wasn't that it like it literally just wouldn't occur to me uh -huh. right because because it it was so in my everyday life of everyone coming over to the house was a musician yeah um wow. so that was that was really unusual um and then on, on the flip side of that though was um i grew up with my mom being a professor of communication um so i, I from a very young age also kind of got <laughs> both worlds of, of music and art and and of academia um and when i was when i was six um a, a little bit before the austin music awards event i um 
I was diagnosed with um, a, a really rare uh, hip condition called leg calf parthes, um, which essentially stems. They, they don't know what what causes it actually still, um, but it it um, starts with kind of a loss of blood flow to your um, to your femur heads and your hip, um, and um, I wound up being pretty lucky because. Uh, I got a pretty progressive doctor at that time that wasn't doing some of the older methods of treatment, which was kind of a penguin splint, which is essentially just like a really hard splint on your legs. Um, so I, I was doing more like physical therapy, that kind of stuff, limited range of motion. Um, but from a, so from a young age, I, I kind of, A, had to stop playing sports during that type of thing um, and lived in a really like a... <laughs> uh an incredible amount of pain at a very young age um and i think that that while obviously saying that out loud it sounds bad <laughs> and sounds like it sucks um which it was not great mm -hmm. um i i think that it it kind of allowed me to pursue other things mm -hmm. and excel in other areas um so i uh, you know, you mentioned the wired thing is I, I got really involved with uh, architectural studies and sustainability studies. Uh, and I kind of threw myself into music also from a young age. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was it was kind of a curse that I took what I could out of it. I, and I, I, I was told when I was 10 that I I'd probably have arthritis later in my life. But other than that, I was pretty much good. That didn't wind up being true when I was like 15, probably. 15 or 16 started having a lot of pain again and and i i still have pretty messed up hips from that um and i, I probably live at like a six to a seven on a pain scale this is yeah. like the baseline so you know it, it's one of those things that again it's it's uh it wasn't the easiest cards to be dealt but i kind of tried to you know while i couldn't run around and, and do as much of stuff as i could when i was a kid i was able to kind of focus on and other things that I, I still really appreciate having that time to this day. How do you, man, how do you, uh, how do you manage that pain? What, what is, um, what, what's, what are some of the ways you, you deal with it? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it sounds absurd, but, um, anyone who's experienced any kind of chronic pain kind of will understand that it's, it's one of those things where like, if I think about it right now, I can feel it, right? But other than that, it kind of fades into the background and it just becomes like a kind of omnipresent um, pressure almost mm -hmm. that you feel. Mm -hmm. But it just becomes like a, a dull pain. Um, and you know, I've been like offered uh, countless drugs for it. And mm -hmm. I was always um, very weary because a i've like heard a million stories of that and uh you know my my dad has struggled with addiction on and off mm -hmm. um since he was young so I, I never really went down the road of of wanting that so i've always kind of cared for that with um primarily actually in uh in the last 10 years or so um with exercise kind of like um rock climbing has been the biggest kind of help for me mm -hmm. um because it's it's kind of an exercise of really kind of flexibility and building up muscle strength around your hips and legs um to support kind of bones that are not as great um so i uh that's kind of mainly how i've i've done that and then channeling it into you know music not really writing about that but mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm you know it, it it always gave me a very different perspective on life um yeah which i i do feel lucky for that's that's amazing man um uh, years ago i was at a uh i don't know if you ever heard of mbsr mindfulness-based stress reduction john cabot zinn actually started and i was at a uh, a week-long intensive retreat uh learning and it was really an eight-week program that compressed into a week an intensive week and one of the things that was really poignant to me, uh, most of the people there were, uh, there were, there were other professors, there were, there were therapists, there were people, yoga people, people you'd expect to be there. Uh, but yeah. there was a small group of people with chronic pain issues whose, whose doctors didn't know what to do with them. And they, and apparently their doctor said, well, hey, you might try this mindfulness, this meditation thing, see if it, it helps. 
Um, and William, you, the, they found each other pretty quickly at the beginning of the week, and you could see them yeah. sort of like, what are we doing here? This is strange. This is weird. By the end of the week, they were the most powerful uh, attendees at that at that that intensive retreat. They were standing up saying things, as I remember, saying things like, you know, my pain is still here. It didn't go away. But what I yeah. now understand is that if that a lot of my pain came from the cycle of thinking about my pain yeah. of wondering, how am I going to get through the day? Why me? Uh, why can't I figure out what's going on? How am I going to do this? What's this going to be like when I get old? All that cycle of monkey mind thinking when they were able to just be present for it and, and let, let those thoughts go, it, it felt more manageable. Does that resonate with you? Yeah. And I mean, God, John, you gotta like, give it that that's kind of true about so many parts of life right like i mean if you uh i mean i've also like i've been very open with the fact that like i've dealt with uh you know on and off like anxiety and depression for a long time and i like mm -hmm. if you just think about that you're gonna yeah you're not gonna do much right yeah and so you gotta i mean you can feel sorry for yourself as much as you want and you know that's a that's a brutal way of saying it but, uh, you know, you, you give yourself that time and then you're like, okay, what, what now? Right. Cause you're not, if it's not going to change, there's not really a point in, in, uh, in kind of dwelling on it. Um, and so it is kind of like, you gotta just take it and then be like, okay. And, you know, like it's somewhere like, you know, thinking about kind of state of the world and, and, and tough things going on. It's like, you you got to be like, okay, like this is horrible and not let that become a uh, debilitating thing that you, you can't really operate with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, perspectives, everything. That's, that's great, man. Uh, have you tried meditation? Is that something you've, you've experimented with or do you have a meditation practice? I have tried it. It's never been my thing. I, my brain has always kind of felt like a million, like a uh, bullet trains running into each other uh yeah. and coming off the tracks yeah. um and as much as i have had friends and people that have dated and anyone say that uh you know i should try it and it's really worked for them and i respect that so much i cannot focus yeah. at all so for me i think that my, my meditation is kind of whether it's like going on a run or hiking or uh rock climbing it's or music. That. music or music right? yeah. yeah it's yeah. having it's having like a period of time where i am able to just kind of think or not think mm -hmm. or some yeah. combination of the both yeah. of those yeah. Yeah. um and you know whether that's playing my own music or, or listening to music um yeah. it's yeah. always been a place of escape and also contemplation i think that's when i connect with music the most is also when i see a reflection of myself in it or a reflection mm -hmm. of my experiences in it um mm -hmm. yeah i can take something out of that well speaking of that let's talk about your music and let me come at it at this angle who are some of the musicians who inspired you at a young age and really made you want to write and 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 do music yeah um i was recently talking to um actually just for this for this record that i'm i'm working on i i was doing a photo shoot with todd wolfson who's been photographing musicians in austin for ever and has photographed me since i was a baby essentially uh and he was asking me that question of of what music i first really got into and i was saying that probably the first musician that really struck a chord with me was um it's this musician from uh from Pennsylvania named Matthew Ryan, who mm -hmm. was just a phenomenal songwriter, really was I was talking to uh to a good friend of mine, Jeremy Nail, about this actually recently because he's also a big fan. And he's uh he's a musician who isn't really like uh you can't pigeonhole him into a genre at all, but he borrows from a lot of different genres. And so I think it was musicians like like Matthew Ryan um, that really kind of struck that chord with me. And then kind of older musicians um, like the Stones were really big for me. Um, 
I think that musically as a, as a guitarist, the two musicians that were most kind of formative were listening to um, Neil Young, especially like Crazy Horse. And then on the flip side of that, his acoustic work mm-hmm. of, I think that when I, when I first learned to play guitar and I was mostly, I still am mostly self-taught, um, you know, you learn like the, the, the scales and you learn how to do all of that. But it was really first listening to to Neil and Crazy Horse where I was like, oh, you can just play one note and like mm-hmm. let that ride. Yeah. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, I, I listened to a lot of Bill Frizzell, um, who brought much more of the uh, jazz approach, but then also less is more in a, in a different way of uh, essentially um, kind of in a similar way of what brian may would do is is playing guitar with yourself so using sustain of notes and then adding to that yeah um and so it was it was it's kind of been like all over the place because i've listened mm-hmm. to jazz i've listened to rock i've listened to folk country like all all of that um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that i think that that is really valuable is is to kind of take inspiration from all those things because then you're not like you know, I've I've met a million musicians my age where you're like, I wanna I wanna be the strokes, I wanna copy that. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, but like what else? Like the yeah. strokes are amazing. I love the strokes. Great band, right? Yeah. But um if you're just trying to do one thing, then then there's not really a point. Like you I think that getting inspiration from a lot of different things is what makes something sound different and interesting. And uh I don't know, I've been listening to a lot of this musician recently named uh MJ Linderman, uh, who plays in this sh- uh, like shoegazy band also called Wednesdays, but he put out an album, uh, I think last year called um, Boat Songs. It was really good uh, and definitely had like a little bit of that like Wilco inspired tone to it, but also uh-huh. he brought in like clearly inspiration from like grunge and mm-hmm. indie and like some like just punk kind of. Um, and like that blend of of things and kind of I mean it's like uh it's it's mixing it up right you're mm-hmm. you're taking a bunch of stuff and and throwing it around your brain for long enough until it spits out something new. Yeah, uh, I have not read any critical reviews of your work. I don't know who people have compared you to, but who would you who have you heard yourself compared to, or who would you expect like uh, that cliche thing? If you like William Harris yeah. Grimm, then you would probably like who who are some artists that you think kind of uh people would hear in your music. You know, I um it's interesting cuz I the projects that I've put out so far each got very different responses, which which I think was fair cuz they they kind of each had a different yeah to them definitely yeah yeah um but i got like the the initial album that i put out foreign fields which was i think in 2016 now um there was a lot of comparison to you know my bloody valentine Mm -hmm. neil young and crazy horse Mm -hmm. um all of that kind of uh informative rock and and those elements um and then you know the the musicians that i've I've been compared to most recently with some I, I, I had some really beautiful um reviews of um of Plainfield tapes in St. Clair that drew a lot of comparisons to uh Bonnie Vare and Sufian Stevens, uh who are two musicians I've also been listening to for a very long time now. Um and I, yeah, it's always it's always interesting to um you know as a musician, you always also get asked the question of like, not even like in interviews, but just in, in your daily life of like, oh, like what musicians do you sound like? Or like, uh-huh. who do you listen to? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's always like hard to, uh, it's hard to take an objective perspective on it. Right. Cause you can't really see your music from the outside and be like, oh, it's similar to that. Mm-hmm. But it's always, you know, it's, it's amazing to kind of hear other people drawing comparisons to musicians like that musicians that i've respected for a really long time one one name i didn't hear you mention that i i definitely hear and i don't i hope this is this is only a compliment but i definitely hear connor oberst 
Uh, yeah. Does that make sense to you? Oh yeah, no, of course. I I've I've heard I've heard that one actually as well. Uh, personally, I've had a lot of people tell me that, especially in in vocal style. Yeah. I, a lot of people have yes. have drawn those comparisons, which is I, I mean, bright eyes is, I mean, yeah, I mean, talk about kind of an like one of those like indie artists that has really informed an entire like yeah modern movement. Um, right. Right. And also, you know, the work that he did uh, when he was working with Phoebe with um, with Better Oblivion Community uh, Center was was amazing. You know, that first album uh, with, you know, Lua and all of, of those were, you know, hugely influential. And that idea of also just kind of a raw, heartbreaking yes. voice over acoustic guitar um yeah it's something that i i kind of shied away from for a long time and then kind of wound up coming around to um but it's also something you know there's nowhere to hide there which is yeah, which is a hard place to get to but it's great yeah when you can and and great segue into the new record there are only endings tell tell us what what is that going to be like yeah um i so i put out two eps in 2021 that were sister eps is kind of how i viewed them um it's interesting because uh, saint Clair was an ep that i i primarily worked on or i initially worked on i'll say outside of the pandemic it wasn't a pandemic project i recorded it here in austin um at a studio called the bubble with frenchy uh smith and he he uh he was the engineer and everyone on that um and i i recorded it with um with a couple friends i i recorded it with a longtime collaborator of mine and and uh really really close friend of mine david goodrich uh who's a guitarist and then another really amazing musician and longtime friend chris searles um and i was part of the awesome music foundation at that time and so i was given kind of time to work in the studio and i was supposed to record one song and i called the director of austin music foundation beforehand because they were like you have one day to record in the studio for a song for a single for us i was like okay that's great can i record five songs <laughs> i can do it um and they were like i mean i'm not gonna say no right uh and so uh we recorded that really stripped back um we set up like one old mic from the 30s in the room Wow, and I really wanted it to sound like, you know, older like Towns Van Zant albums. Like I wanted it to sound like someone was sitting on the front porch playing for you, right? Mm -hmm. Which is um, by the way, by the way, the only th time I've seen you play <laughs> was sitting on Will Johnson's front porch. Yes, yeah. I. Uh, oh God, that that's lovely. I love Will to death. Yeah. He's uh, speaking of musicians who influenced me. Uh, will has had a yes. huge influence i mean centromatic and and also is i mean centromatic was you know really big growing up and is like the only time i've seen them live was uh for their farewell tour but um right hanging over there actually you can yep. see it in the screen that's their yeah. uh yeah. their uh farewell tour um poster from 20 from 2014 and i have their actual specific one from from their austin show it i think the parish um yeah, I, I was actually right in front of the stage of that show were you were you there same. Yeah. yeah 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 um yeah so uh yeah will again huge yeah. huge influence dramatic yeah. and also his, his newer albums but um but yeah so i wanted to sound like a, i was you know just playing at someone's yes. front porch and i feel homey um and then i so we recorded five songs we put out one uh kind of around the beginning of of a little bit before the pandemic so it was like probably beginning of january we recorded it in, in fall of 2019 um and then i kind of just shelved the rest of the songs i was like i'll maybe look at them eventually and then uh you know pandemic rolled around uh didn't write or really work on stuff for a long time I, i'm one of those people that like a lot of it was like a split right half of people like were prolific and wrote so much during that time half were like i can't during this right yeah and i was definitely in the camp of like it like i i can't work in a time when it's like that's it and i don't have all these outside influences of like you know like ups and downs and all of that 
so I, I eventually came back to it and listened through and added, you know, instrumentation, mixed, all that kind of stuff, and put out St. Clair. Um, that summer after that, I put that out in, like, winter of 2021, or I guess tail, the beginning, January 2021. Mm -hmm. And I then uh, was up in Vermont, uh, and I set up a studio up there, and I recorded now uh, an EP called Plainfield Tapes, which... Mm -hmm. um, was definitely like the next evolution of what St. Clair was supposed to be. So it was even more stripped back where St. Clair still had some drums, all that kind of stuff. Um, playing field tapes was just me, vocals, keyboards, and and my friend uh, Cameron Riggs, who's one of my best friends from undergrad and who I'm still really close with to this day, added piano to it. Um, and then I was, so I put that out and I was like, okay, I'm done with that. Came back to Austin. That summer, um, after recording up there for like three months, uh, put out Plainfield Tapes that same month, went in the studio and recorded um, another album, which is going to be probably released later this year, actually, oh, um, okay. called Annie's House. Um, oh, oh. Uh, in addition to to their own endings. Yeah, in addition to their own nice. endings. Nice. And it was it's a predecessor. And I, uh, it was the most kind of alt country not even it's not country at all but um kind of uh, uh thinking about that kind of more acoustic sound and it, it annie's house was recorded a lot with uh acoustic guitar i it was the first album i've ever done when i when i was just playing acoustic guitar in it and i wasn't really doing electric i, I wound up going back and recording lead lines for that mm. but um it was mainly wanted to be driven by like piano acoustic guitar and then have all these elements swirling around it Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm done with the acoustic style that I did for Plainfield Tapes and St. Clair, and I'm gonna, this is the next thing I'm working on. Um, then about a year passed, uh, and I, I went through a lot of different things in, in the last like six or so months, including uh, my dad having a stroke, dealing with a lot of, you know, the fallout of that, uh, mm -hmm. different life changes. Uh, and I'm also about to finish grad school, which I did during the pandemic, which I felt really lucky to get to do because it was perfect timing. Mm -hmm. um, architecture. And, right? Yeah, architecture. And I, uh, and over the last year or so, I'd been making demos here or there. And I started sorting through them. And I started finding these songs. And I was like, oh, I'm going to, I mean, I have another album and it's, kind of it's what i didn't think i was going to go back to uh and i i was like it also needs to come before whatever annie's house is going to be because it it feels okay. like the final uh stage or moment uh in this moment of transition that i'm going through and it felt like a bridge between what i'd been doing from foreign fields to jake's to uh st Clair to plain field tapes kind of this feels like a bridge into what's next. Um, and it was definitely returning to that style. But, you know, where with Plainville Tapes, I was recording kind of entirely kind of these like couple takes, kind of treating like a four track, uh, and then sent it off to other people to add a couple things here or there and mix and mastered myself. This one, I, I wanted it to feel like everyone was playing in the room together. So mm -hmm. it's still no drums, no bass, but is acoustic guitar, electric guitar, um from from David Goodrich again who I mentioned previously uh background vocals from Amy Cook who's a musician I've listened to forever and love and then um piano from my friend Cameron again but it, as opposed to sending tracks I actually went to uh like Cameron's house and we recorded for an afternoon just recording his upright piano in his living room and you know I had a Amy come over for a night where we just kind of hung out for like four hours and recorded in my living room and I wanted it to sound like a room. I didn't want it to sound mm -hmm. pristine or perfect. I wanted it to still, I still left in bits of Amy laughing ah. or my dog storming into the room to disrupt mm -hmm. things. Nice. Cause that's what I, that's what I'm drawn to in, in songs and recordings. I mean, we were talking about Connor Oberst before, but he's someone who always like had it felt even when stuff is like really tightly controlled because I'm I'm someone when I'm working I know exactly how I want it to sound yeah I know how I want to get there but 
within that tight control that I I have, and I have a desire to control kind of I which I try not to do as much, but I I really like having control over things in general, um, and so I like living in moments where something changes or you know a name gets called from the other room and you kind of yeah. hear it at the back of the track, but it's not does it ruin it? Oh, those happy accents are cool, man, for sure. Uh, well. Let's see. I, I heard you say, I think it was on uh, the How Did I Get Here podcast, I'm incapable of stagnating. And uh, I think you pretty much just uh, proved that uh, with that explanation of what you've been doing, man. That's that's just crazy. Uh, and, and you're back to playing the Wednesday night residency at Continental Club. How does that feel? I mean, it's it's amazing. It's, you know, John, it's coming, it's coming home really for me. Yeah. Uh, cause it was, you know, Connell Club is a club that I grew up going to. Um, and now is a place where, you know, I, I walk in and it's like hugs from everyone from the, from the staff to the, to the frequenters who, who go there. Um, and it's also kind of my place of experimentation. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I have the, uh, Everyone in my band's unfortunate in the, in the sense that I will throw a new song at them without telling them we're going to do it. Um, and so it's the place where I kind of will experiment with stuff and be like, does this, is this actually work or is this an insane thing? And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's a second home for me. So it's good yeah, to be back. You, that's great. You, you feel safe there, but so, so it's uh, a good place to experiment like that. That's awesome, man. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, I've got a bunch of maybe kind of rapid fire questions that we can we can deal with to start start uh, winding down. I have to ask you first, though. Uh, what was it like dealing with John D. Stroke? I, I know when I talked to him last time, he said, "Well, he's been dealing with my health problems his whole life." I won't <laughs> speak for him, but uh, uh, what that I know that was that was some tough times and scary and, and he's on the mend and, but you want to, anything you want to say about that? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's not the first time that I've received a call like that. Um, mm -hmm. and I, you know, it's a fact of life that it's not going to be the last time. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, but it, you know, um, I'm always the one that's been very aware of that, just given my family and, and life experiences. Uh, and, you know, we've been through some, some real stuff. Um, yeah, and your, but, own, uh, your own issues as well, man. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, I, I think it was one of those things that was tough, really tough to go through. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it also just kind of was something that put a lot of stuff into perspective for me and sure um again i you know i i didn't really i wasn't working on music as much i was writing obviously but i wasn't actively recording or anything over over the summer really or mm -hmm. into the fall just because it was a lot was going on and i was kind of processing a lot and, and dealing with a lot of stuff but um but it was definitely something that uh was kind of a bit of a slap in the face of just kind of waking up to to that reality again and again it wasn't like it was a brand new thing or something that was new at that moment it just was a it was a little bit of a wake up call yeah a little bit of a a reminder yeah man life is short uh we're all hanging by a thread and and we need those reminders periodically to make to make what time we have even more uh important well, well let me hit you with some rapid fire questions and see what happens here uh the idea is super short answers but if you want to talk more about it that's fine uh, what's the last thing you listened to? Last music you listened to? I was listening to it was it was the band that I was talking about earlier. Uh, MJ Linderman was the last thing okay. I was listening to. Before that, I was listening to um, Julia Jacklin, who's an amazing songwriter. I think from Australia or New Zealand, who put out a really good album last year. Um, really okay. worth checking out. Right on. Uh, memorable shows and let's do it this way uh and this is a really tough question and don't worry you won't be held to it for life if you later go oh i should have said this but most memorable show that you've attended most yeah. memorable show you've played 
good question um most memorable show i've attended would have to be um it's uh, it, w it would actually have to be a show that i saw uh in october so i am not a music festival person at all in fact i hate music festivals it's not my thing at all mm -hmm. um but i was very very lucky to be given passes to go to acl um and uh I went and I actually wound up going both weekends because of that. And I saw uh, Phoenix play at ACL, um, who is a band that I listened to when I was younger a lot more than today. But they live, again, I've seen a lot of live concerts, as you can imagine. Um, I grew up going to them. And I think that for a while I had kind of a desire to not go to them as much because it felt like it was like why would i go to the thing that i do for work when i'm not working yeah yeah, yeah. um but seeing phoenix live was it just like their energy on stage having done it for so long and their um their sound was also just phenomenal live and it was very clearly a live show it wasn't something that was pre-recorded mm -hmm. um but the crispness of hearing especially like at a music festival like Anyone who's been to a music festival knows that it's the worst place to hear the band you love because it's just not going to sound good ever. And I don't know how they did it, but it just sounded amazing and it sounded like a live performance still. So it'd either be that or or this Intramatic show that I have the poster of over there, which was, again, kind of an earlier one. Um, as far as best show I've played, um, would either be uh, I did the first show back after the pandemic was at the continental club and it was kind of the return to the continental club mm -hmm. and it just it was so sweet to play live again and yeah you know there was nothing like that crowd also who had you know not seen music right. live in so long so it, that was incredible as far as that live loud band thing but the flip side of that was um new year's eve 2019 um I played a show opening for Bob Schneider for his New Year's Eve show at the Paramount. Um, and I did it with, again, two collaborators on this album. Amy Cook sang background vocals and David Goodrich played guitar. And it was just, um, I was an insane person. And I said, we're not using DIs. We are going to set up condenser mics on stage. And we're going to play where you just hear the guitars and the vocals. And it was, you know, like an hour of people really listening to kind of acoustic music being played acoustically mm -hmm. um, in this beautiful historic theater. And I've played at that theater before, but there was nothing like that show really where it, it had a feeling. And I was playing a lot of stuff from from St. Clair at that time. And it, it was just it was a magical it was a magical experience. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Uh, this is a. Next one is a question we could spend an hour talking about, but but just you know try to try to say thirty words or less on vinyl versus CDs versus streaming. Where where is it all going? Uh, is is uh, there's a resurgence with vinyl, but is it eventually just going to give way to streaming, and that's the only way we're going to listen to music? What do you think? Mm, uh, I'll be very brief. N no, we're not going to give way to streaming. Um, what I'll say is I spend 90% of me listening to music, listening to MP3s and listening to Spotify, right? But I also spend probably 10% listening to vinyl. And that 10% is I've had a long day and I come home and I'm cooking dinner and I put on a record Yeah. or I have a friend over and we listen to a record together while we're talking. Um, and so I, you know, you, music is more accessible than ever. And that is, has its upsides and downsides. Spotify is horrible. But what I'll say is MP3s give you a way of listening anytime. And vinyl is a moment of, of just appreciating it as an yeah. experience. Yeah, it's a deeper experience for sure. The thing you like living, like least about living in Austin 
Um, it's expensive and there's traffic yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Is that and then yeah, it's you know the the good thing though is there's still good people here and oh an yeah. amazing community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, William, when I, I told you I, I got to Texas in '73 and discovered Austin pretty quick, but quickly, but it took 20 years to get there. Um, and I didn't move there until the early to mid '90s, and uh, it had already started happening then. Uh, and the first song I wrote after I moved there, the opening line was Los Angeles has moved to Austin. <laughs> so I feel you, man. I know. Uh, what pisses you off? Uh, the thing that pisses me off is the thing that also makes me most happy, which is people. Uh, yeah. I have a uh, very short... Um, attention span i my cord of uh, the what i'll put up with with people is 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 short just because it's like i don't like wasting time with that and i value my time a lot and so if someone is going to be like nasty or hateful or not engage with you know at the very least discourse it 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 makes me uh angry yeah yeah. Your favorite restaurant in Austin? Ooh. Um either Ves oh, either Vespio, which I grew up going to. Um or a restaurant that opened a couple, I guess over the summer called Mayday that I I go okay. to fairly frequently cause it's within walking distance and I've had some friends that work there and so I know a lot of people that work there and they have a really good steak. Really good steak. Right on. Other than Continental, your favorite place to play a show in the world. It doesn't have to be awesome. Oh, hard one. Um, outside, I think. It, it, that's broad, obviously. But yeah. um, some of my favorite shows have been unplugged shows, whether it's like on a porch or... Yeah. in the forest not playing to anyone um both playing outside is the worst place to play because sound is unpredictable but that's also why it's fun and why i love recording outside i recorded some of this new album outside just because it you get intrusions from the outside world and you get weird uh intricacies of of your guitar and, and vocals you don't get anywhere else yeah yeah I, I I just I'll make a quick comment on that. Um, I you, a few years ago, I was supposed to. There was a benefit for the, our local radio station here that is a true um, all volunteer, old school public radio station. Yeah. They're they're sort of rare, and there, there's a benefit, and a bunch of people are supposed to play. I was supposed to play, and we ended up traveling, and I couldn't play. And but I I I called her i phoned him and i said hey i'm up here in the woods in maine <laughs> maybe i could record something on my phone and and you all could play it somehow stream it somehow and we worked it out but man that was so amazing i was all yeah. by myself in some serious uh, you know forest in maine but yeah. i also i was recording it sort of for an audience it was yeah man it was fantastic yeah that's so, exactly uh that's what playing Plainfield Tapes was for me was I was kind of in yeah. I was in the mountains in Vermont that was like 20 minutes to a small village drive and wow. that wasn't like a town that was like 20 or 30 people lived there so it was very remote but it was so fun I a lot of that was recorded outside or in this loft area with all the windows and doors open and you just could hear the birds during the day or the crickets at night and there's something like that beautiful uh, this is a really challenging one and may not be fair, but what are you most proud of? Um, I think that, uh, I am, I'm most proud of taking kind of happiness and, and everything I do. I, I don't think that it is 
I, I don't think that it's productive for me to say that I'm you know, most proud of this most recent album I recorded or something like that, because it's, I think that it, as musicians, everything we're doing is constantly trying to improve on that, but the thing I'm, at, I'm really most proud of is kind of taking moment, or like overcoming myself in a way that has allowed me to take moments for myself, whether that's going on a walk and just enjoying, you know, a morning or an evening, but I, I'm proud of myself for kind of for like having those moments of so just kind of trying to enjoy life as much as we can. Yeah, love that. Love that answer. All right, man. Last two questions. I, I gave you a heads up about this because I know yep. they're they're questions that can make people uncomfortable, uh, but it's, they're questions that I'm really interested in. They're really related. And the first one is, what do you think happens when we die? Any concepts, beliefs, ideas? I mean, what, what do you ponder? What, what, what about this mystery that we see? We're here one minute, we're gone the next. What do you, what do you think happens? Yeah, this is this is an interesting question because this is I personally, this is the question that I, not the question. This is a type of question that I would, I love to engage in at a party late at night. Mm -hmm. and most people dread me asking them, <laughs> but I um. Yeah, I'm that guy too, man. <laughs> I uh, it's fun, but um, I think that I'm not religious. Um, I grew up, you know, with some uh, religious beliefs of like uh, Catholic that kind of thing, but it was never like a a strict thing in any way. And I, I'm I'm just not very religious. Um, but um. So part of me is is like maybe nothing, but part of me is also like I don't really think that it is. I, I don't really think that nothing necessarily happens when we die. I don't really believe in this whole idea of afterlife and heaven and hell necessarily, though, either. Um, but we have a close family friend who is a professor. Um, he said a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things that he always says is um, uh, energy like can't be created or destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very basic understanding of that. And I don't pretend to know anymore. But what that at least kind of triggered me to start thinking about was that there's something that lives on whether that's just like us in the memory of people that we were close with mm -hmm. or you know writings we did or just some kind of feeling because I, I still you know whether that's deja vu again i don't pretend to know anything about it but i think that um i still feel some of those people that i was really close to growing mm -hmm. up like yeah. George Reef, who passed away, or Stephen Bruton, who passed away, where right? yeah. you know I still feel them in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I and I guess kind of part B of that question is: Are you, we don't know? Are you okay with not knowing, or is it something that bothers you to not that you don't know? Um, uh, it depends on the day that you ask me. <laughs> I think good, that, answer. Um, good answer. Yeah, I, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I'll say quickly that it's, it's kind of like the part B of, of what we were talking about earlier, which is like, if I think about it a lot, yeah. it's terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But if I think about it a lot, I'm not going to do anything. So I try to yeah. not think about the fact that we don't know what's next. Yeah, yeah. All right, William, last question. When you are dead and gone, what do you hope people say about you? What kind of memories would you like to, about you, would you like to leave behind? Um, I, I, um, in the words of, again, my, uh, kind of pseudo uncle growing up who's not really my uncle george reef uh he was a good hang mm -hmm. that's that's all i mean as much as you know i love when people like me etc and you know i hope that i am viewed as being a kind person etc mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing is is being a good hang because that's what i appreciate and 
you know, I'm someone who's decently busy, but I really, you know, I put a lot into the time that I spend with people I care about. And that's where I really get most of my enjoyment. I'm someone who's like caught between being an introvert and an extrovert. And I'm, I'm very, like, I have an interior mind and I am introverted in a lot of ways and I'm very shy. But I also, like, my happiest moment is getting to go over to someone's house that I really care about and love and, you know, cook dinner with them and have a drink with them and mm -hmm. just talk and laugh. Mm -hmm. I love that answer, man. And you have been a good hang for the last... <laughs> 50 minutes or so. I really appreciate you doing this. I've enjoyed chatting with you. Um, I I know our paths are going to cross. Um, I, I, Absolutely. I get, I get down to Austin now and then. I'm actually talking to John D. again coming up here pretty soon for this series. He was the first guest I had on this series. Wow. You will, you will be guests, I think it's 42 or something like this. So, uh, uh, it'll be nice to have the John D will not only be the first guest, but the first returning guest. So, uh, but he and I have been making noise about getting together for a while. And so I'm going to come down and see you guys sometime. And in the meantime, thank you again for doing this. I wish you all the best. Have a great year, man. You as well. It's good talking with you. Take care.